tonight's conversation um, is part of our live interview series. Um, we do a, a different, uh, a, a, a range of different sort of event typologies, and um, we're here with, um, as I'm sure you guys know, uh, Abe Burmeister, um, who is the uh, co-founder of Outlier and um, uh, basically the mastermind behind Abstract Dynamics, um, which uh, is not only a kind of um, sort of what former place for reflection on everything from the financial industry to, to cities, uh, but is also an archipelago of, of serving for other people's websites, including Mark Fisher and um, I think Simon Reynolds also hosts through you. And uh, no, no, almost, almost. almost. Okay, um, but so maybe that will come up later with the whole idea of the kind of um, digital octopus of abstract dynamics and and and, and your your goals with that. Um, but yeah, so the, the goal tonight is to talk to Abe. Um, we'll do kind of 20 or 25 minutes of just like a formalized Q&A here, but then um, at, at, at any point, if there's something that outrageous that you want to follow up on or if you want to chip in after 20, 20 or 25, feel free to um, jump into the conversation. Um, so yeah, so I'd love to start with um, going back to basically a conversation that you and I had about a month and a half ago where we were looking at the idea of mobility and um, the idea of how clothing can either restrict or enhance or otherwise frame different types of physical mobility. And I'd love to just talk about how um, Outlier specifically engages with that idea of, of physical motion, physical activity, and physical mobility and how it's designed into the clothing. All right. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of what Outlier is about. It's really about how you move through a city and how that reflects in clothes. And it started very simply because I couldn't find what I wanted, you know. I couldn't actually find clothes that helped me move to where I wanted to go and the way that I wanted to go and, and feel comfortable doing it. Um, it was really just a, one pair of pants. I wanted to be able to ride my bike and walk into a business meeting and not worry who I was meeting and what the weather was and, you know, whether my clothes were going to fall apart. So, um, and it started just with like a let's go to the store and buy a new pair of pants um, and there weren't any and then went to another store and another store and then like a year later I was like man there's these pants just don't exist they, they're not there so I um, figured I'd have to figure out how to make them and, uh, and that was it we started with one pair of pants and that was uh, about three three and a half years ago and, and now we make a lot of things um, as far as that uh, the idea of you know using a pair of pants that allows you to to ride your bike and go to the boardroom and so on. Um, I'm curious about the actual uh, design of the garment and how you went about doing that. I know that you guys use um, a special kind of stretch fabric, but you also use a specific kind of tailoring and that kind of thing. So I'm curious about the actual structure and, and design of the of not only the garment but the fabric that goes into it and 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 what what is the balance between those? Yeah, well, I mean it's a problem centric sort of design, so. A lot of it's about the fabric, like um, what I discovered or what we discovered really early on was that the uh, the fabrics that are getting used in the clothes you buy are not really the good ones, they're the cheap ones. Um, I guess it shouldn't have been surprising, but it was, you know, so I, I finally found like the right fabric to make this, these pants, it's a four-way stretch fabric out of Switzerland, and it's really expensive and the companies that you think would be using it just don't touch it. They're, they're too scared. It doesn't hit into their pricing model and they can't figure out how to, to make these pants. It's not like nobody else said, hey, I want to make this, use this fabric to make something great. They just said, oh, I can't make it affordable. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a huge realm of fabric stuff out there. There's, you know, like we use a lot of those, these four-way stretch woven it's a lot harder to make a, a woven fabric that stretches in, in left, right, up, down, than just left, right. Um, it's just how a loom is set up. You know, it's a grid, and you stretch fabric across one way, and then you shoot fabric through the other way. And it's really difficult to maintain that calibration in both left and right and up and down at the same time. So um, we use a lot of four-way stretch fabrics, and, and then when, when you have that, it's easy. Like okay, wow! You put you know you sew a pair of pants. So the the first pants we made our original garment, the OG pants, was just a really simple pair of pants and a and a fabric that did all the work. Yeah. Um, but you know we didn't want to just make one pair of pants. You know once I started the project and it seemed to be real, it seemed like okay, we better start making more stuff. And then the, then it gets trickier. You know that was like 
the, the low hanging fruit, right? So we took it and we ran with it, and people bought it and the press covered it, and all of a sudden I, there was a company, and um, yeah. So and then what was next? And so um, the the real engineering I think really started when we started tackling shirts actually. Um, and which was a subtler problem, which is just that shirts aren't that well designed for moving. Um, it really started with just like, on again on a bike, like we're not really a bike company, but, but a lot of the early problems were very bike centric. Um, and just leaning forward, trying to get in the handlebars and like feeling the shirt stretch across your back and being like, this shirt is just not cut for, for this use. And, you know, I still really believe that the bicycle, like, absolutely one of the best ways to move through a 21st century city. Mm. It's just, uh, you know, certainly not the only way, but it's, it's very liberating in, in, its, uh, in what it does for you. You can get places quicker and, you get, and it's healthier and, and you're free and you're out in the air and you're not just uh, waiting for the train or circling the block looking for a parking space or trapped in a car. So, mm. um, so with the shirt, you know, we, they, they actually... We've never really found a four-way stretch woven shirt. There's half-stretch shirts that they sell out there that sort of do the trick, but they're not that nice. So we really, just, at that point, started looking at, at how garments were, were cut and how movement reflected that. And what we realized really quickly is that the, like movement is very rarely thought about in, in most garments. It's thought about in the sports industry, like when, you know... Uh, you go out to a sports trade show, you're, there's, yeah, it's all about movement, and, they, you know, they usually just do that by using the stretchiest thing they can find, which is often the ugliest thing they can find, um, and not necessarily the most comfortable thing they can find. Um, so we realized, you know, like, in a traditional fashion sense, like, these clothes are, are built on a dress form, they're built, up, you know, essentially on on a mannequin hanging there, and they're, they're made to look good on a mannequin. And then maybe when they put them on a human, and sometimes they put them on a human, sometimes they don't, but when they do, it's very, you know, the, the guy's just standing there, or the woman's just standing there. They, they don't even ask them to raise their hands. It's like, how, you know, stand there, stay still, and we're gonna make this garment look flawless while you're standing still. But uh, who stands still all day? I don't know. Um, and it's just, it just wasn't considered. There, there's very few exceptions out there in terms of people who actually consider how does it actually move. I mean, that's why you get shirts that look great and fit great when you're standing still, and as soon as you try and lean forward into a vaguely like active position, it, they just don't work. Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, it's funny you mentioned you know who stands still all day, and you know like security guards and military personnel and people who are in some sort of uh, effectively, almost like a human decorative role in a, in a space. So, someone who's yeah, like standing guard or, or that kind of thing, or in a processional role. Um, and then there's the there's actually a, speaking of breaking out, and breaking in. There's a there's a scene in the bank job where um, they, you see a tailor for for just a few yeah. seconds, and he's uh, sewing up or no, he's putting a garment on a on a soldier, and the soldier thinks it's too tight, and and the and the tailor jokes that the or maybe it's not a joke, but that um, the reason why it's so tight is because you can't raise your head, your arms above your head, and therefore it, it inhibits you from giving in to uh, an impulse that you might want to surrender, and so the clothes are meant to prevent you from surrendering because you physically can't raise your arms, um, so you basically you have to fight. Um, so I think it's interesting then that there are this there's this kind of like untapped I, niche of clothing that I feel like outliers gesturing towards, which is clothing that, that allows a totally different type of urban habitation in the sense that you can be a businessman and a commuter. You can dress like James Bond and ride your bike to work and you don't have to change clothes in between. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I mean, that's, that's really, like, at the core is just that the idea that clothing can be liberating, that there's certain just these seams, like, built into your everyday clothing that, that constrain you in a very subtle way that you generally don't notice. Hmm. Um, but when you put on some of our garments, like you notice it immediately. You're like, "Wow! Like I didn't realize I was being restricted mm-hmm. in this way." Um, I think certainly like the the four way stretch pants in particular, um, and it's not like you couldn't get you know you could go and buy a sweatpant that's going to stretch. It's a knit and fabric, and it stretches mm-hmm. four ways, and it's it's comfortable in a physical sense. It's comfortable, but socially, like 
hopefully it's actually kind of uncomfortable um, to be wearing it outside of your house. Um, some people obviously are, are very comfortable wearing sweatpants everywhere. But, um, <laughs> Snuggy. Yeah, okay, exactly. Thanks, Carl. The, uh, but uh, and that's that's a whole other sort of movement that we address, and that that's which is the social movement. Like that you're hopefully moving through social spaces every day, um, and if you want to make something that's comfortable, you have to feel like you belong in that space. Um, mm-hmm. And there, there's a very like uh, egocentric way you can feel comfortable, which is just to not give a shit at all, <laughs> and not pay attention to like the people who are staring at you or laughing at you or whatever it is that you're wearing and uh, or you can accept that you're in a in a social environment especially in a city which is like a massive social construct um, and and work with it so you know we make clothes that you put on and you're, you're gonna look like you belong and feel like you belong when you show up even though they do things that, that those traditional garments don't necessarily do so you know, a dress shirt is traditionally, a, you know, a white collar shirt, right? Essentially, and uh, your job is to, you know, get on the train and show up at a desk and sit at a desk and do God knows what. And um, that's what the shirt is designed for, right? And we take that and say, no, like let's open this up and let's take this into a, a much wider space. Yeah, um, I'm curious about the, the intersection or the uh, or kind of the encounter between clothing and the city. And um, you made a comment when we were talking a while back about the the kind of remnant infrastructure from a previous age of dressing. Um, and you referred specifically to like the like hat hooks and hat shelves and that kind of thing. And I guess I'm curious about talking a little bit about how uh, what people wear in a certain era uh, affects actually and literally the design of the buildings around them and what things get attached to buildings or, or cities that encourage and or prevent certain types of dress. And I'm just wondering if we could talk about that, 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 that the intersection between clothing and the city. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we were talking about hats, really. Like, to me, like, it's interesting because that's the infrastructure you see left. If you go on a Metro North train, like, there's literally, like, I mean, people call it a coat rack or a bag rack now, but it's literally just a hat-sized rack above the, you know, that's still built into most of these trains, and it's like you got on the train and you took off your hat and you stuck it up there and you sat down, right? Mm. You had your hat and your briefcase and your suit, and that, that's what people wore. If you look at photos of New York in the 30s or 40s, you see like just a, a sea of hats, right? Mm. And and there was an infrastructure built around that, right? like, okay, you, socially you were not supposed to wear a hat indoors, right, as a man, so like, you have hats, everybody wears them, and then as soon as you get inside, like, there's this sort of, yeah, it's an architectural challenge, like, what does everybody do with their hats, right? And they literally built, you know, coat rooms, hat rooms, and, you know, hat racks, and, like, the, the infrastructure was there, and, like, people could transition pretty seamlessly instead of just standing around with their hat, like, trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, and you find that, like, I mean, that's really the problem you get with a, with a bike, like, because the infrastructure isn't there now, like, where you show up someplace and you, like, you're like, what do I do with my bike? And, like, you try and find a place to lock it up. Uh, most of the places you lock it up are not actually legal. Mm-hmm. We've actually had policemen, like, tell me, like, oh, yeah, lock it to that sign. And it's fine, but it's actually you're not supposed to lock the sign. So it's like one of those gray areas of law that nobody enforces, but no, you can't legally lock your bike to some street sign lock it to a bike rack but how many bike racks are there and like by the train or, you know where you need them um, and then it extends also if you wear a helmet which is you know uh, and helmets are a very tricky area with cycling because the uh, there's a clear correspondence between high cycling rates and low helmet usage um, and, and the uh, deciphering, like the you know, exactly what helmets do to your head and, and how much they help you, is tricky as well. But you know, when you're riding in New York City, most people feel a lot safer riding with a helmet. But then when they show up, at you know, you've got this bulky thing, and like the hat infrastructure is not there anymore. Like it's missing. <laughs> you either need a like larger bag just to fit your helmet, or you need to carry it around, or you lock to your bike and hope that some dog doesn't pee on it, or, you know. It's, yeah. uh, it's an infrastructure challenge. And obviously, like, when you're talking about cycling, that goes much further into, like, actual bike lanes and 
signage and, and a lot more than that. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to, to just go back to the the, the, the actual physicality of the, of the clothing um, about design precedents that have gone into um, the creation of outlier clothes and both precedents in the sense of things that you were inspired by but also things that you wanted to get away from and so are there particular examples of suits like the Brooks Brothers suit as the kind of no-go zone or is that something that you're gesturing towards and how far back does this go? Uh, I mean, with suits, suits is like kind of like the, the holy grail um, in a way. Like the, the suit is like a very constrictive garment. It, it literally has a lineage that goes back to, to military armor and you know military uniforms. It, you start, it emerged like when when people stopped wearing armor essentially, and, and you started getting these military uniforms that were very rigid and structured and. You know, the way like people fought them was actually very rigid and structured until the American Revolution. You know, that was like study the American Revolution, like the red coats apparently would line up and expect that the Americans on the other side would be uh, or British subjects who were trying to become Americans like, on the other side, like would just line up and like you know, they would both do their shooting and like it was like sort of like this kind of codified game played out between different kings and their pawns, right? Um, and the American revolutionaries obviously like said, "Hell no! This is our woods. This is our land. We're going to hide behind this tree and behind this bush and spread out and, and fight different sort of combat." But um, that's really what a you know a suit like derived from those kind of red coats. The same sort of if you go to England on Seville Road, there's still tailors that will make military uniforms and they'll make you a suit. And the type of suit they'll make you is a very rigid, constraining suit. Um, and there's a lot of structure in it. There's a huge layer of it. And, um, it's relatively straightforward to make a, an unstructured thing that looks like a suit jacket that, that moves pretty well. And I think we actually have one in the works. But we kind of really avoided going into that realm just because it's not a, a true suit. And if we're going to really try and make a true suit that, that moves, that means tackling all the different layers of structure that are under there. Um, you know, there's coarse hair in most suits. There's like everything. It's, uh, there's a whole, you know, five, six different layers. Um, and they're all relatively constraining, like, uh, uh, especially like in terms of arm motion. So, um, it's sort of just like we're a little scared to dive into that. It's taking some time because we, we realize that the, the challenge there is huge. Um, but on the flip, in terms of like real inspiration, a lot of it, like the one of the most interesting things that that we found, like digging around, and um, you know, on one hand, we were like when we started, we were really diving into this world of technical fabrics. But the other side, we were really diving into history books and doing sort of research, and we, we came up uh, into like the early Everest expeditions. Uh, George Mallory, in particular, is a fascinating story because. People think he was the first person to reach the top of Everest. Um, and then he died on the way down. And they found his body and they found his camera. And they can't really prove that he reached the top. They're pretty sure he reached the top. And he, you know, his body was found relatively close to the top. So if he didn't get to the top, he got damn close. Um, but if you look at photos of his expedition, there, it's, I think it was in the 1920s, and it looks like they're going fox hunting or something. Fox hunting with a lot of extra layers, like they're wearing tweed, right? And like they're they're all layered up, and that people were like, yeah, he just didn't have the gear to do it. And then so in the, I think it was the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s, um, when Edmund Hillary finally like reached the top, he was wearing a whole new generation of textiles that came out of World War II. He was, you know, down technology had been perfected to sort of how to keep down inside a fabric because down is so fine, which is what makes it so warm. And he was using something called ventile that we actually essentially use. We call it submarine cotton. It's a descendant of this British World War II fabric that's um, 100% cotton but waterproof and windproof and breathable. Um, and he, you know, obviously made it to the top of Everest and, and got back down. Um, but the thing, going back to George Mallory, is like people started researching it um, about 10 years ago, like just trying to do academic research. Like, was it really the clothing that, that stopped him? And uh, there was actually a team that reconstructed the clothing that he was wearing and went and tackled Everest and 
reached the top and came back down. And the crazy thing is they said like that in a lot of ways, not in all ways, but in a lot of ways, the clothing they were wearing was actually better than the most advanced mountaineering gear of, you know, 10 years ago, which is pretty much the same as what it is today. Um, and the reason for it, a lot of the reason for it was because it was custom tailored to the bodies. And Mallory also had uh, a patent. He had patented a, essentially a suit jacket with what he called a pivot sleeve. So we kind of stole that name on our shirt. Um, but he had a patent on how to, you know, was, and the problem he was trying to solve was literally like when he's climbing a mountain, like literally like with an ice axe and like trying to get up, like when you raise, raise your arm up, like your, your sleeve comes down and that creates a small little gap um, in your sort of entire, you know, clothing sphere. And that gap like lets in enough cold air that it can kill you. Um, they say like one of the like, Frequent like causes of death on Everest is people who literally will will take off their gloves for a minute to snap a photo at the top, or take off their goggle and like that that little bit of exposure, like they basically built this huge bubble of warmth around them, and they just break it open for a second, and that's it, they're done, you know, and then you know they can't get back down, unfortunately. Um, there's a book that um, I don't know if you know, but it came out maybe. Six months ago, eight months ago, it's called Spacesuit by uh, Nicholas Demancho. And um, it's, uh, Nicholas is, a, is an architect and historian at, at UC Berkeley. But it's, it's a really interesting book in the sense that it looks at um, the, well, it looks at a whole bunch of stuff. But the, the center piece of the book is the spacesuit, the Apollo spacesuit that was worn and allowed uh, human beings to, to get to the moon. Um, but what's, what's so interesting about it, well, there are two things that are really interesting about it, is that um, the suit, this kind of symbol of, uh, of masculine American sort of military governmental might, was actually created by Playtex, the bra company, and it was yeah. made by female seamstresses who sewed this piece together, and it was basically men wearing a kind of advanced bra on the moon. So I think it's really just kind of uh, hysterical on the level of just this, this sort of gender coding that got flipped in the, in the late 1960s on the moon. Um, but then also what's interesting about the suit is that they didn't actually invent any new types of fabric to make it. They just simply took existing fabrics and put them in a certain kind of sandwiching. So they had 21 layers, and then they had 28 layers, and they ended up with something like um, in the upper upper 30s or 40s is how many layers there are in the spacesuit. But so they didn't invent any new fabrics. They just they just put it together, and it actually pr- protects the, the human body from outer space, which is extraordinary. Um, so I guess I'm curious about like where innovation in clothing design and th- these types of things comes from because you know you mentioned that you're using things that are you know descended from World War II British fabrics and so are there is there kind of like a, a fabric geometry that has yet to be discovered that is the kind of holy grail of fabric or is it all just reusing existing fabric types that you know in, in new ways or what, what, what is the innovation there? I mean it's in some ways it's just constant you know, slow evolution. You're talking, there's two ways to make fabric, essentially. You can weave it or you can knit it. And, you know, it's it's how you're trying to intertwine the, the threads to keep them together. Um, there's a few, you know, we're playing around, like the backpack we just did uses a non-woven, uh, what they call it, but it's a non-woven, non-knit structure um, that's new. Um, in some ways, it's using uh, essentially, you know, non-woven fabrics generally are basically like advanced forms of paper. So I guess some ways there there's three forms of fabric. Um, very few of these novel fabrics are made into garments. Um, hospital garments are often made out of it. Um, Tyvek, so they say novel and fiber. Um, but yeah, I mean it's really like the, the advances are, are slow and and incremental in, in that world. Like the you know advances in loom technology, like they're subtle, like that most of that was invented 200, 300 years ago. Mm. Uh, most knitting techniques were invented a long time ago. Um, but things change, like the, the sort of like inflection points that you hit are, are subtle. Um, and a lot of them have to do with how small you can make the seams or, or how tightly you can weave structures together, how tightly you can knit things together. Um, so like, you know, we use a lot of wool and you know, I don't know if you remember growing up, but most people like had an awful connotation with wool because wool was this itchy, scratchy stuff. And um, it's actually one of the most expensive fabrics out there. And when you use really nice wool, it's, it's gorgeous, but um, and most people weren't used to it. And I think if you look back 50 years ago, like it just it served a very different purpose. Wool was a technical fabric. 
and you were willing to accept a little bit of scratchiness because it performed better, and then if you went to the really luxury point, you could get a pretty nice hand feel, but the, uh, the, the nicest wools of, of 50 years ago are kind of like medium grade for today, so. Um, and I think it's, it's incremental. There's no like, oh, wow, rupture of like a new fabric that just happened and occurred. Um, yeah. But it, but it's subtle, and a lot of it is, is the use case, like like Playtex. I mean, that, that's an amazing story because, like, you know, when Playtex was competing for this contract to to make the spacesuit, they were competing against a bunch of classic military contractors that were like, "Oh yeah, we're going to build a spacesuit," and they they saw it as like a form of armor, and they were like, "We're going to basically build a suit of armor for you that that will protect you from space," and then like, I feel, you know, what they found was like. A, it didn't necessarily protect you as well, but B, it, you know, you could not move in it. Like, it's like, yeah, you can send some guy out into space wearing a piece of armor, but what's he going to do? Like, kind of float, I guess. And, um, you know, you actually, like, if they were actually going to do stuff, they were going to get outside of and start manipulating wires or manipulating instruments and, like, you know, like, you're going to space for a reason and you're risking your life for a reason and it's hopefully a, it's a gain real scientific data, not just uh, stand there in a, in a piece of steel. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned uh, uh, a while back that you, going back to the kind of gender mismatch of the Playtex versus uh, Northrop Grumman kind of dichotomy, um, that when you are testing or prototyping or looking into future designs for clothes, that um, there's kind of a surprising role between female clothing designers, or rather clothing designers for women and clothing designers for men and different types of tailoring and different types of yeah. seamstering and that kind of thing. So I'm curious if you could just talk about that, that that sort of back and forth between the genders there. Yeah, we got really lucky when I started out in that I ended up with uh, a pattern maker, you know, in making clothing, the pattern maker is the person who creates the flat 2D, it's a piece of paper literally at that and fabric is flat it's two dimensional and the pattern maker makes the flat form and has to figure out how to transform that into a three dimensional garment and how it gets sewn together so it's a really crucial role and the pattern maker that, that I found and that was literally just by wandering around the garment district and asking questions um, specialized in doing female garments but didn't really care but she's very much like a female centric pattern maker where her specialty is and she was willing to do almost anything and then, you know, it produced pretty rough stuff early on. Um, and once I learned enough to realize how rough it was, we started trying to refine it. And that refinement, like, we went and started going to, like, really well-respected men's pattern makers, and they were completely rigid. It was, like, shut down. They were like, what are you trying to do? I know how to make a shirt. I know how to make a suit. I know how to do this. And... If you want to, you know, I'll make it look good for you. I'll, I'll make it, you know. But they had no interest in trying to challenge the, the structures and try and make things perform better because they, they're essentially just working out a role that they know. And, and they know how to work within a certain constraints. And they, I've never found a male pattern maker, or not a male per se, but somebody specializing in men's clothing that, uh, that was willing to do what a, female pattern makers because they have such a you know female fashion is so much more fluid and changes so frequently like they're willing to do essentially anything they're like not necessarily because they thought it was you know they're thinking about function but just because you know they're used to designers trying to come up with crazy things that usually from a visual standpoint not a motion standpoint but when it comes to laying out the pattern on a certain level it's the same thing um, so we found that it could still really useful to work with pattern makers that, that are more comfortable making women's clothes than men's because mm. um, they're more open to change. And then at a certain point, it's actually better to switch back over and say, okay, here, we've, we've gotten the breakthrough. We've changed how the sleeve is constructed. Now let's try and make it look like a traditional men's shirt. And that's where the male pattern makers come in because they, that's their expertise. They can get to those subtle little details that distinguish like a decent men's shirt from a good men's shirt from an excellent men's shirt. Um, and so that's the level where we kind of switch back. 
Um, I, my, my final question before uh, kind of throwing it up to the, to the audience is um, actually goes back to uh, kind of the future of, of fabrics and fabric design and that kind of thing. And there was, um, I think it might have just been an urban legend, but um, there was an idea, I think it was a short, maybe like blog post on Wired that started it, where um, in a couple of years ago, basically Obama made a presidential appearance where he wasn't surrounded by bulletproof plates and or bulletproof glass and that kind of thing. And so the the theory was that, in fact, he was wearing a suit that was made of bulletproof Kevlar and that his actual suit itself was bulletproof. Um, and he, so he wasn't wearing bulletproof yeah. you know, plates and that kind of thing. Um, but I just, so one, I guess I'm just curious what you think of that theory. But then two, like, you know, the, the, the notion that it's not even necessarily new fabric types but in totally new materials that are going into these things, whether it's like carbon fiber, Kevlar, um, these new types of things that can can become garments that weren't previously garments before, or for that matter, weren't even fabrics before. And and what and is there any kind of thing that you'd like to see experimented with on, along those lines? Yeah, but there's a lot of wild stuff out there. We we're working like most on the backpack side. We're working with something called Dyneema, which is the world's strongest fiber trademark. Um, so I don't know if it really is or not, but they have a trademark. Uh, but it's incredibly strong. It's, Significantly, like depending on where you read it, 10 to 100 times stronger than steel. It floats on water. Um, it's really expensive, of course. Um, we're using it to make really light bags because it's so strong you can take out most of the bulk. Um, but it is used to make armor for troops as well. It's apparently can stop the like AK-47 rounds um, at a certain thickness. Um, so there's some crazy stuff out there like that. That we still haven't figured out what to do with, but somebody will. You know, there, there's a hundred percent Teflon fabric out there that they use to make psoriasis garments. It's <laughs> insanely expensive again. Um, it's uh, comes out. It's like you know, it's like the Austrians and the Italians are working with it. And I think that they make psoriasis garments, and then uh, Arctic ultramarathoners are in love with it. They say it's amazing; it prevents blisters when you're Arctic. Marathoning, ultra marathoning. Uh, so it's revolutionizing that sport. But uh, for the most part, like everybody's just like, "Are you kidding?" Even even we say, you know, we're used to using expensive fabrics, but this stuff is like brings it to the "Are you kidding?" level for outlier. Um, <laughs> what what is that level? Um, it's like about eighty, ninety dollars a yard. Wow. So it's um, yeah, it's pretty. That, that's a lot. You know, your shirt is a couple yards of fabric, a yard and a half, two yards of fabric. So, and then the fabric cost is just the beginning. You gotta sew it, you gotta, you know, manufacture it. You gotta get it somewhere. You know, we cut out the wholesaler um, in general, so that that helps us. Like that's our kind of counterbalance to using expensive fabrics is that we cut out the, the markup at the retail shop, which is tremendous, um, especially in. In fashion, like it's, you know, usually the price is going to double or triple when it hits the store between the the brand and the store. So we cut that out and, and then try and fill it in with higher quality fabrics and uh, better ideas, I guess. Yeah. Better executed ideas. Yeah. Um, are there any questions in the in the audience? Thank you. I'm I'm curious. You're just talking about psoriasis garments, and that was making me think about another thing, which is kind of like. The idea of fabric supports or, or wraps, like you see a lot of athletes who would be wearing like knee braces and things like that. And I was wondering, like when your clothing becomes a kind of prosthetic like that, could it even be that you would design like clothing that might rehabilitate you or force you to move a, a better way where you're not twisting your knee in some weird way? Do you think about it like that rather than just range? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I know enough about how the human body moves to jump in that. Like, I think I'd be scared. I think there's a, a level, like, there, there are definitely people doing it, and there's, like, if you go to a running store, you'll see a lot of compression garments, and, you know, like, there's a lot of uh, swimmers have been using them, like, in the Olympics, like, the last Olympics, they set tons of swim records because they were literally using these compression garments. I don't know how much of it was from the like actual compression, how much it is from the re reduction of friction that they were getting, but like um, there's no question that that some things can really change how the body performs, um, and it it can definitely like affect how you move. There's no question about that. You're, you you know, 
you can see it more obviously in shoes, obviously, but you know, if your the fabric is pushing you one way, you're gonna move towards it, not fight it constantly. Um, and people in suits, you know, don't reach above their head because they can't. Um, so that there's definitely stuff happening in that realm, but I think like to be comfortable with that, I want a medical degree of some sort. <laughs> like, um, because you can easily help somebody and easily like really hurt them. You know, I've had weird knee injuries from just changing like uh, the setup of my bike. You know, the angles on a bicycle slightly, and all of a sudden your knee is exploding. So that's exactly the sort of things that you can come across. Like, with, you know, if you're tweaking how people move, how they walk, how they step. Um, I think if you do it really well, yeah, you can probably help people. You probably help them move better and faster or more comfortably or whatever, but. Um, my guess is that you want to do that on a bespoke level, really. Like, you actually want to tailor it to everybody's body. Um, but then there's plenty of people buying compression garments out there. They love compression tights and compression socks. And, and they had, that technology really emerged in the medical world first, you know, selling socks for people who had circulation problems with their feet and things like that. So there is some real science behind it, but it's still a little murky. Uh, any other questions out there? Yeah, you said you uh, design a lot of bags and like carrying gear. Um, uh, we just started. Okay. Well, I was I was going to ask what is your sort of main source of inspiration in terms of uh, like harnesses or attachments to the body which aren't necessarily wrapping like a like a sleeve or a leg. Um, like do you do you ever think of like a, like an underwater underwater sort of like rig? that you would hold something in or does it involve some type of um, good or product that you want the user to carry or is it that specific or do you try to make it really all purpose? I I think it's much more open and all purpose like the the bags are really early stage for us the first bag we did was a collaboration with a a company in Maine called Hyperlight Mountain Gear Um, and they were playing around with the same thing what I was talking about before Dyneema non-woven Dyneema um, it's a relatively new fabric in a non-woven form. It, it's been around for about almost 20 years now. It was like in the early 90s, it revolutionized the America's Cup. Like people started making sales with this stuff, um, and it was the only use out there was to make like sales for the America's Cup. And then um, slowly, like the uses expanded a little bit, and uh, the, the people who found it. First, like outside of the sailing world, were these ultralight backpackers, people who like love to go out for two weeks in the wilderness with eight pounds on their back or something. These guys literally like measure every ounce um, of equipment they're carrying, and it's and they're like, okay, what's the absolute lightest, strongest fabric we can find? And they found this stuff and they started building backpacks with it. Um, and we connected with the, this company up in Maine that started first one in our opinion to make really good looking backpacks with it um, it doesn't matter how functional it is if, it, if you look like you belong on a mountain and you're running around New York City like you're going to be uncomfortable in a lot of situations um, I mean I'm wearing a boots right now <laughs> uh, are you uncomfortable? no but they're, they're just for the season right there okay. yeah, next season I'll have to switch so I'll be uncomfortable but uh now, hopefully not, but it but it is sort of yeah. There, there's a level of follow, you know, like what you're allowed to wear it has to follow what what people around you are expecting you to wear, right? So, mm-hmm. and it happens to be a little more acceptable to wear hiking boots in 2012 than it was like five years ago. So, I already asked a question. Is it there? Okay. Uh, I'm I'm curious. Another, I, I think. You know, biomimicry became super popular, at least in architecture, and like looking at kind of fish scales and things like that for for structural ideas. And I'm curious as to whether uh, on that level, like, are any animals or other creatures that you guys ever look at in terms of how a fabric might fit together? Yeah, we do look at a little bit. We always look at armadillos because they're so freaking cool. <laughs> we never really figured out what to do with them. 
um, but they look really cool. Um, I mean, I, I think that we look at humans first as an animal. Like, I think there's still like, you know, we're still we're making clothes for humans, and there's like people aren't thinking about how you know clothing designers don't look at movement. It's really simple. So um, for the most part, we stick to like close to the core there. Um, we do use uh, one biomimicry technology like extensively, which is something called Nanosphere. Um, it's a self-cleaning uh, treatment that's, that we apply to a lot of our fabrics. Um, that's the scientific term, self-cleaning. We usually put it in quotes because it's a little weird. Um, but what it is is uh, supposedly uh, designed to mimic the surface of a lotus leaf. And um, what happens with lotus leaves is that things can dry onto them and like it can get a little bit dirty, but as soon as water hits it, like they'll roll right off. And, and it's because the surface of a lotus leaf on a nano level is, is basically a fractal. So like a bunch of different spikes. Um, and there's no hooks for any stains, to literally, like proteins to grab hold of and lock into. Um, and then as soon as water comes along, like it floats on top of the surface and just sort of knocks all the debris that are floating on top of it. So. Um, yeah, it's supposedly self-cleaning, but it not quite self-cleaning, but it stays clean a lot longer. Um, and it's a pretty fantastic technology. We put it in a lot of things. Okay. You were saying that at the beginning, the inception of Outlier is really the critical part was finding a fabric vendor that did the critical research that you were looking for. So I'd love to know a little bit more about your partnerships. That your partnerships are really important in having the right pattern or having the right supplier. And kind of how do you make sure that they are long term sustainable in their businesses because it's so much more to yeah, uh, it's, it's tricky, but um, we're really lucky to be in New York City where there's still a garment district, um, so that helps. Um, it doesn't really help with a lot of the technical fabrics we do because they often don't have offices in New York, and when they do, they don't really sell it. Like It's because they sell something different. And uh, The fabric company we work with a lot, like probably our main fabric supplier that, that did the original pants fabric, they actually have a a rep here in New York um, who was kind enough to sell to me when I was, when, you know, just some kid like asking to buy some fabric. Um, and so, uh, you know, got a lot of respect for her for that, but we learned really quickly. She had no clue, like, like the technical properties of what she was selling beyond like a few bullet notes from like whatever her, her sales rep meeting. Um, so we had to go to Seattle and start working with the rep out there who, who sold to the outdoor industry and understood the fabric inside out and what was going on and why some things worked and some things didn't work. Um, so, and then in terms of building relationships with factories and suppliers, it's, it's really tricky because it's, uh, you know, they, they're looking for work and uh, unfortunately, like, the, there's a little, you know, the work in New York is shrinking a little bit, hopefully it's coming back. Um, but there are still factories closing and closing, and it's tricky. But on the flip side, like at the same time, everybody wants everything at the same time, so things get really busy. And then it's like, even though factories are going out of business, like they're, it's really hard to get things made. So um, it's it's tricky. It's just a constant balancing act. Um, trying to find new people, trying to build the right relationships with, with people, trying to figure out how much work you should be sending them. And, Trying to figure out when you can do things when they're slow, as opposed to when they're crazy, and um, it's just uh, it's tricky. Yeah. Uh, I guess I kind of remember when you started all this mess, and I remember the first iteration. It's amazing, so I'm very excited. Oh, I just wonder. There were a few things I was wondering about, and I don't know how mature they're going to come out, but. Um, uh, the, the first one is, I guess, um, a more, they're, I guess they're intertwined. One of them is, I'll, I'll say one of them too. One of them is kind of um, your overall kind of desire socially in, in, in terms of the action of your, of your work. In other words, uh, is your hope to facilitate mobility within the city by, you know, such and such. And the other thing is, well, what about stinky people? Um, 
I'm just wondering about steak. Like that's kind of one of the main factors right, when you ride your bike is you show up and you're all sweaty and kind of stinky. And you know, I remember listening to David Byrne talk about that too, and he's talking about his bike work and said like, hey, you show up and you have this beautiful sheen and glow. <laughs> and, I'm, and, and, and I'm thinking about, I guess I'm just wondering if the project on some level is to make, to ease in the mobility into the workspace, or if it's really to maybe reshape the way people act with each other in that workspace, you know, or, they, or both, you know what I mean? Like, make it cool to be Make it cool to be <laughs> on some level, yeah. Like, no, I mean, where, 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 where do you see, do you want to get rid of steak? Yeah, I mean, sweat, sweat's a, a big problem, you know, like what happens to the materials, uh, yeah. um, and it's tricky, um, but a lot of it, like, actually works on a material level, like what you're actually wearing, so we, we work a lot with merino wool, and merino wool, like, really doesn't stink, I mean, it does eventually, <laughs> but it takes a lot longer, and it's, it's literally how the, the wool handles moisture, it actually sucks the moisture from the surface of the fabric into the core of the fabric and separates it. And what, what happens is like, the reason why you stink is it's not actually the sweat itself, it's that the sweat has bacteria in it. And then when you sweat and saturate a fabric, you create an environment that the bacteria likes to grow. And and when the bacteria is growing, it's actually releasing like what the, the smell is. Um, so that's like, yeah. And so when you're wearing cotton, Cotton's a very absorbent material, and it, but it, what it does is soak the moisture and like sort of hold it both in the fibers and in between the fibers, and it creates this big like little ocean of, of sweat, and like bacteria just have a big old party, and like they, they start to smell. Um, so when you're wearing wool against the skin, and or another like a hydrophobic fabric, like you create space where like the, you just don't get the same effects and you don't smell as badly. Um, there's a health element, like because like the what's actually causing the stink is not the sweat itself but the bacteria growing in the, it. So people who sweat more tend their sweat tends to not smell as bad. So yeah, it's um, yeah, so like if you any it's you know, I, I can verify like when I don't ride my bike as much as I used to because I mainly ride commuting and my commute is seven blocks now. Um, <laughs> it used to be more like five miles. Um, but you just sort of like push the sweat out, you know, push the bacteria out and you become, as you become healthier, you become cleaner and don't smell as much. It doesn't mean you might look grimy and sweaty. So um, yeah, it's definitely a challenge in like trying, you know, designing layers and designing fabrics that that repel sweat, so we're not sure if this one has it or not, but you know, we have a fabric we've developed that's actually like a sweat resistant sharding fabric, so sweat won't show through unless you like really, really push it. When it does show through, it sort of disappears quickly and it, and it works. Um, it's, uh, it's called, we call it Blaze Cotton, it's, uh, it's available. On our website. <laughs> Finally, we, we went through a lot of challenges with it, um, but um, it works, and we're trying to improve it to make it even better. But um, yeah, it's tricky. But um, I think, like you know, if, if enough people like are cycling every day and cycling vigorously every day, like then yeah, people are going to get used to people sweating a little bit more when they walk in the door. I think. Um, my guess is that as, as cycling, if cycling, you know, grows significantly, people are going to start cycling slower. Um, you see it in a place like Amsterdam, where like there's a sense of infrastructure, and people like are biking like barely any faster than walking, right, or on these huge heavy ass bikes. But um, you know, I think you know social things will change, but it's also tricky. And, and you know, we, we have some of the answers in our clothes, but Certainly not all of them. Uh, we're always looking for ways to make things better. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you from an entrepreneurship standpoint? And uh, maybe if I can offer uh, one of my favorite television ad- advertisements from a long time ago, where these maybe they saw these guys huddle around a 
um, a computer screen, they're obviously launching a web company, and like they get the first order, and they're like, yes. And they get the second one, and they're like, oh, baby. And they get the third one, yeah, and then like the numbers of like 5, 10, 15, 20, 100, 500, and they're dancing. And then it goes to like 20,000, and they're like, we're swamped. And then it just goes from the roof to like 2 million, and like, fuck, the order comes broke. You know, like, it's like, it means, so just what was it like for you, you know, from an entrepreneurship standpoint to, to feel it? Uh, I mean, we got really, really lucky. Um, a lot of breaks that we caught. Um, the, even just finding the fabric or like walking into the right factory in the garment district or, or meeting Tyler, my partner, who's not right here, you know, but that was a very chance encounter. Where, like some barista was like, hey, if you need to meet Tyler, he's doing exactly what you're doing. So, um, huge amount, like little piece of the press, whatever it was. So, um, you know, luck's tricky, but a lot of it's just being ready to take advantage of it when it comes. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, we've grown pretty quick. Um, and it's kind of crazy, you know, like three years ago, it was like me and Tyler and, uh, and Jesse um, in Tyler's living room, like working full-time jobs and then selling clothes on the side. And then all of a sudden, like we're taking over the house and then we're like, there's more people and we got to get an office and all of a sudden there's all these people in the office and it's uh, it's pretty wild um, and there's there's always constant challenges so you know it's always trying to just stay a step ahead I guess um, you know I had done a, I had another company before that um, animation company that, that lasted about four years so so I had some experience and it took me about four years after that ended to like even dare to start another company. It's, it's uh, just endless amounts of work. But I, mean, I think that's it. You just have to just give it your all. It's like a kid. You have to, it's like, if you're going to do it, just throw every ounce you got into it and see what happens. So when I bike, I always have at least another shirt, not two times a day, but I have at least another shirt. And I'm always in a bathroom beforehand, like drying off. Anyways, that's, that's, that's the point. But um, I was wondering. I mean, I actually think that is the point. I think that's what he doesn't want to have to have to do anymore. Right. It's like that. That was. A- yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I certainly did that, and it's crazy. And I, I was a freelancer too, so. Sometimes you don't know where you're going or what what the situation or can you get in the bathroom or do you have to go in and get the key first or where is the bathroom or who you're gonna be on the LA and then there was definitely some like awkward elevator situations <laughs> occasionally where you're like, um, yeah awkward bathroom situations and then who wants to like be changing in a toilet you know it's like not that fun <laughs> um, so yeah but it's, that's a lot of what we're, we're trying to to design those situations out. You know, obviously, like, it'd be great if everybody showed up, had a shower for you, and you had enough time to take a shower, too. But, you know, we, uh... The point is that, like, you shouldn't have to worry about that. It shouldn't matter. When you get dressed in the morning, you shouldn't be worrying, like, oh, is there a bathroom there? Like, do I have, like... I, you shouldn't have to be carrying a shirt. You shouldn't have to be wearing you know. my, my end goal, personally, is, like, to just have be able to like get on the airplane without a bag, you know, just wake up in the morning, get dressed and like go, oh, you know, like, oh, I gotta go here, I'll just get on the airplane, no, no bag, no nothing, just uh, the clothes, like, I don't think that'll ever happen, like, but uh, I would love it too. I was also wondering about, like, uh, it seems like you want to, you had a certain, like, the female person, like, design thing, and then you Turn back to um, men or people that are more trained in tailoring than men. And I was wondering, like, is, do you see your, like, your position more as trying to be more of a chameleon back into like, what normal society you know, like, just clarifies like, particular dresses? Or are there mo- is, that, is that driven by the market? Or are there moments where you're like, this would actually be more like, functionally, structurally better for 
people to actually wear as opposed to just like falling back to social cues? No, it's a, we always take the social into account. Like it's, um, there's, I mean, arguably there's not, but for the most part there's a lot of really good companies making technical garments out there. They're not always using the best fabrics, and there, there's certain limitations that, that we know now. Like, but for the most part, they're doing a pretty good job, and we're not really trying to take them on. Like, you know, some place like Arteryx, you know, they, they make really well done clothing, Westcomb, or, um, and we're not trying to challenge that. We're trying to take what they're doing and, and bring it into the city environment, and. Yeah, it's sort of like invisible technology is sort of how we look at it. Did, did you still have a question? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. What do you get in any? Um, back to the archaic, or the, um, the hat rack. Yeah. That kind of idea. Do you have any idea of what we're doing now that will look funny to people 80 years from now that, that might stick around? I try not to predict the future. <laughs> no, no, I'm just like, not very good at is it. Is there something that that you see now that you're like, guys, this is this is a weird behavior. Like everybody has to bring a hat in, and then what do we do with it when you when you bring it to the train? Like, is there something that you see now that you're it's just, it, it's it's as ridiculous or, or as kind of funny? You know? uh, let me let me get back to that. I'll think on it for a minute. But there's nothing that, that immediately pops out. It's, you know, I have no idea what the world's going to look like in 80 years. I'm sure it will all look like ridiculously silly to whoever is there. Um, or maybe we'll look really classy and sophisticated because everybody's going to be wearing snuggies and. You know. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's more likely to be that actually. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it, like maybe it'll pop up, in the, you know, if, if we answer a few more questions. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to, I guess, ask something sort of more of the lines of, somewhere along the lines of what you guys are talking about, but I guess, like, what do you see your role or, you know, outliers' role as? Are you, um, you know, I guess, like, innovators looking for new, you know, you were talking about that fabric that, whatever the sweat thing that you said that you guys like, actually developed that. So are you in the sort of inventing new stuff business? And, you know, if so, are you looking for, you know, are you looking to like, create new opportunities for people, you know, open the door to more possibilities of, you know, maybe getting more people to be more active? Or do you see yourself in your company as more of a kind of, I guess you could say, like, design? Research maybe uh, you know not so much an innovative you know coming up with new things, but like, uh, looking at things you already have you know looking at old fabrics uh, and giving them you know new applications and new designs and you know I guess that would be sort of making the lives that we already live easier or you know less sweaty and less smelly. So, uh, that makes any sense. I mean it's tricky because we're we've been moving really fast and like like we started with one pair of pants that was based around the idea of bike commuting and then we took that and basically unconsciously said like okay like like let's we don't want to just make one pair of pants let's make some other let's make a shirt and let's make a jacket and, um and then at that point when, once we had some of that going we started looking around and being like wait like it's really frustrating to have people like constantly tell you like, oh, I like your clothes, but I don't ride a bike. And we're like, we, we don't want to just get pigeonholed in this sort of like cycling space and that's it. We wanted to, you know, our stuff we were doing was not just about cycling. It was, cycling was definitely part of it and it's still part of the problems that we're always tackling, but we, you know, it wasn't about building our identity as a cyclist. I go to Interbike, or actually I don't go anymore. Maybe I'll go next year, but it's a huge bike trade show in, in Vegas every year, and, and it didn't feel like home, whereas when I go to like the outdoor show like it was, where we get our fabrics, like it actually felt a little more at home. So, you know, we've evolved like through these steps, and, and now we're sort of, you know, 
more of like a, I guess like an innovative menswear company in some ways and, and we're looking the next step is to is to actually do women's I think um, but we don't know how far we're going to go like there, there's, we're going to hit a wall probably at some point but I was you know I did it initially because I want a pair of pants but I keep doing it because I, I like to learn really um, it's certainly not like what I have to be doing I mean, maybe in this economy it is, but like you know, I certainly had other career paths that I could have pursued um, instead of doing this, and I did this because it was fun. Like because I keep on learning stuff and it's exciting. Um, so we'll see where it goes. Um, in terms of designing stuff, though, I, what I, I like to think of is we design anti stuff. I don't really like there's too much stuff in the world already. You know, there's like we're surrounded by crap, like cheaply made things that fall apart and are designed to be replaced with twice as many cheaply made things. And um, it's just not exciting to me. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of companies that make trinkets and garbage and cheap clothes and whatever, and I'd rather make the opposite things that, like, you know, don't birth extra objects. They, they reduce what you need. They... they reduce the burden instead of carrying three shirts like in a day or you know carrying a huge you know a trunk across the ocean because you're going to Europe and you need that many clothes like it's like no let's just reduce it let's make items that that mean you need less shirts and less pants and less shoes and you know obviously there's some people who are just going to accumulate we have a few customers like sometimes we're like what the hell how much do you see do you have enough already but um, yeah I, I think that like it's it's really a quality over quantity if you want to make it that simple it's like we make things that that replace the need to have multiple things yeah so I guess it would be like your uh, your you know designing garments or you know clothing or whatever Yeah, it's a tricky balance because we never want to constrain what we do. We don't want to be like, oh, yeah, so you're the cycling clothing company. Everything you do has to be 100% related to cycling, right? So we don't want to put ourselves in those traps. But at the same time, like when we started the first year, we very intentionally did focus on cycling, even though we knew that, like, hey, these pants were actually better for business travelers, too, because you want to define the design goals and, and focus in on certain problems. Um, so, you know, we're always treading that balance and we'll see how far we go. Um, I think uh, we, we might, we have, let, let me just ask a question and we can end on yours, too. Um, and then we can, we can wrap up. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious, to actually, going back to your initial question where you mentioned the sleeves and the underwater suit and that kind of thing. I guess I'm curious about other non-clothing-based inspirations. And, and I'm reminded of um, a couple years ago, I went to North Face in Emeryville to interview the guys on their tent design team for uh, basically a short article about the architecture of tent design. And um, what was really interesting was that the, the tent designers came along, but they also sent along one of their garment designers. And it was a guy who basically, um, it sort of worked both ways, and I can't remember which one was the, was the one that was more prevalent, but it was basically he went from shoes to tents, and he was explaining that in his mind, the design problem never changed. And that basically the tent, and it could have been the other way around, that he went from tent to shoes, but I think it was from shoes to tent. But either way, he basically looked at tents and shoes as the same design problem, um, like the same types of tensions, yeah. the same types of internal spaces that have to do certain things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it wasn't just a metaphor. He was actually talking about actual structural and material similarities between tents and shoes. So, um, you know, that a, a piece of architecture then becomes an exploded piece of clothing, or a piece of clothing becomes a super, super tiny house. Um, so I guess I'm curious about that kind of thing. Like, are, do, you, do you see um, design inspirations in things that are either architectural or, you know, a, a totally different type of, of, of like, geotextile or something? Or, or yeah, where, where else do you look for design ideas? Uh, I mean, everywhere, I guess. Like, we're always trying to flow things through the office. Um, on an architectural basis, like, there's a book called Sublime about that just came out about new Japanese architecture that, that we had around the office, which is pretty interesting in that it, it, there's a 
we look a lot at like the, the juxtaposition of nature and technology. You know, we're using these technical fabrics um, that come from the outdoor world, and we you know, lately we've been doing a lot of like when we shoot, we're going out into nature, and we're actually making clothes that can take you back into the back country. Maybe not for you know the Everest expeditions or the 20 days or whatever, but like clothes that can take you outdoors. So we're always looking at that juxtaposition. So um, that's really exciting to me because just watching how how that particular kind of movement, how they place, you know, the, the Japanese have a very different view of, of nature than than Westerners do. You know, we, if you read the Bible, um, nature is kind of this bad thing that, that man is supposed to conquer, essentially, right? It's like you, you're kicked out of the Garden of Eden by the snake, and like, ever since then there's like a, a conflict there in, in Western society. Um, so, and we're interested in a little you know, not making that distinction, breaking it down. And, um, you know, some of our stuff is made with very, you know, wool and cotton. And we're looking at linen now as a really interesting fiber. But um, then we're using, like, nylon constantly or Dyneema, like, new chemical composition fibers. So um, we're always looking at that balance. Um, I like to read comic books. <laughs> so we read comic books and... Uh, you know, lots of Mobius in the office right now, um, and it, yeah, no, it's constant. I mean, just constantly looking at what's going on. Politics is is huge. You, you have to be aware. Sometimes you don't want to be, but like it's always there. And there's there's really crazy things happening in politics right now, both from the Occupy Wall Street to like you know Mitt Romney and his like crew trying to take you know move from the corporate takeover to the political takeover so um, you know we're always looking at those things but at the same time like you know we make clothes so you can talk about it in really broad sense but at the end of the day like what we do is make clothes so so sometimes it's better to just focus on, on clothing yeah um, let's just wrap up with um, your question I was gonna. It's interesting you talk about architecture because I'm looking at the evolution of the tent. How um, yeah. the same way as the evolution of clothes, where you start off with simple lean-to or a stretched piece of yeah. fabric, no, no seams at all, and then now you have the multi-skeletal systems and the changing silhouette or different uh, appendages or wings for different situations. And I was wondering maybe this could come into play with the women's line, but um, how could you start to change? an urban person's silhouette or like is there another like you start off with a reason for making a pant for a bicycle and now you have like another intangible reason to like a use for a certain piece of clothing like a scarf that changes into something or, you know like a, a jacket that unfolds and you know a detachable sleeve you know you know what I'm talking about like yeah I'm gonna play it a diff- couple different ways I can take it, I guess. But I mean, we're, we're playing around a little bit with, you know, like carrying, like literally, like the idea of not needing a bag. So, like, we're definitely looking at that and like, how does, you know, what happens to your jacket when you're not using it? Like, you know, it's gonna rain, but it's too hot to wear a jacket. Like, what are you doing with that? Um, so we definitely look at that. But then on the flip, like, we're we're not trying to be a fashion company. Right? We're not trying to change people's silhouettes. Maybe one day. But like certain, you know, there's certain things we look at and certain things we decided like very explicitly like that it's not what we want to dive into. Like the, there's people out there that that's what they want to do. You know, they're a fashion designer and they want to create a new silhouette, right? And I guess really, I mean in a more practical sense. Yeah. No, in a practical sense, um, it's very function driven and, and I'd say like, you know, we'd love to create new seams. Like new ways that, that things get sewn together um, in ways that, that work better. Um, and it's tricky, but and a lot of times that's just really subtle. I mean, with the pivot sleeve, you know, this is patent pending. Who knows if we'll get the patent or not? It's pretty. And if we do get it, maybe it was a mistake because there's a lot of issues with, the, with patent a lot out there. But uh, at the same time, like, it's just about really subtle changes that most people might notice to how things are sewn together that, that really affect how they actually move. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thank you.